Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to start with a few disclaimers. I just got off a plane from Nairobi, so I've had about three and a half hours of sleep. And if none of this makes any sense, I hope you'll indulge me. Um, also, <laughs> I'm not uh, ag an agronomist. I'm not an agricultural economist. I'm an anthropologist. I work on food security and mobility issues, so I'm going to perhaps take somewhat of a slightly different angle than um, maybe other uh, talks that you'll, you have, will have heard already today. Um, but what I wanted to do was to uh, focus on this kind of um, nexus between food insecurity, mobility, and displacement. And this, um, I'm going to start off by having a, a kind of um, snapshot look at what's happening now in my, the patch where I work, which is the Horn of Africa. Um, but it's built, my thinking on this is built on the last, uh, uh, as Annika says, the last 25 years of working in the region. Um, so I just want to start, this, uh, I thought I can't resist the opportunity to um, share with you the, the current situation of what's happening in the Horn of Africa, because it's not getting very much attention, and it's a quite an alarming picture. Um, in terms of food security. So this is a food security map of the greater region. We, in it, by the Horn of Africa, we are talking about what's really recognized as the member states of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, or IGAD, uh, which is seven countries. So Eritrea, Ethiopia, Djibouti, South Sudan, Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, and Somalia. And, um, and this is a sort of traffic light scene uh, situation. I don't know if people are familiar with the integrated phase classification system for um, classifying food insecurity, but obviously, um, or maybe not obviously, the, red, dark, the darker red color you have, the more of, a, um, of an emergency situation it is. And what you want to avoid is, of course, anything that resembles red. So here and here and here. Uh, and there's another phase which is actually uh, famine, which is uh, almost black-red, um, which we haven't got on the map, although, as I'll say, there, um, uh, as I'll discuss, there are some areas that could possibly be classified as being in a famine situation. So this <coughs> um, is uh, this, where the red parts are show uh, a, what was called an emergency phase, and it mostly in pastoral and agro-pastoral areas of Somalia here. Um, north and, northern and eastern Kenya, it's quite an alarming situ situation. Uh, Oromia and Somali regions of Ethiopia, parts of those areas, and Karamoja in uh, Uganda, as well as a lot of, lot of different parts in South Sudan. And the, the way that that's manifest in terms of livelihood systems is um, a drop in the availability of milk, obviously, um, decline, declining terms of trade, so uh, cereal is becoming much more expensive, where, whereas the cost of selling meat is um, declining, or the, the, the profit one can get from selling meat is declining. Um, the, the harvests in Kenya and Somalia have been, in many places, delayed, and they're much diminished from uh, what they should be at this time. I just drove, flew, actually, from Nairobi to the coast, and the first half of that flight, it's about an hour long flight, um, the first half of that is just entirely brown all over uh, Kenya. And it's only when you get to the coast that you get into uh, a more green environment. Um, in Sudan, the food prices have gone up by 100 to 300%, depending on where you are. And there's increases in global acute malnutrition in, in most of these areas that are particularly of concern. When you look at this map, you see these kind of, it's hard to tell, but there are exclamation marks here and here and here. Um, those are places in which uh, the, the humanitarian or the kind of food security situation is only being held in place by the provision of external food by humanitarian uh, assistance. And so if there's a rupture in the pipeline of that, that supply, then um, the, the, class, the sort of phase would immediately drop by at least one level. So you can see that the, the levels um, of concern there are, are really quite significant. In terms of, um, and of course, one other thing to say about that is that where those bl black marks are, are for the most part, the places where population displacement are the most concentrated. So there's a direct correlation between um, population displacement and food insecurity, both as a cause and as an exacerbating factor. <coughs> 
So just really br briefly to run a bit around the region, in South Sudan, uh, most of the areas, as you saw in the map, are in crisis. And there are three parts in Jonglai Lakes and Upper Nile districts where um, at least 21,000 people are estimated to already be at that famine level. Um, in Uganda, there are one, between 1.3 and 1.4 million refugees coming in from, particularly from South Sudan, but also from Congo. Um, and, uh, and I'll come back and talk about Uganda's approach to hosting refugees in a minute, because I want to make a correlation between some of the uh, work that's being done to support refugees through agricultural um, kind of settlement schemes and, and critically kind of look at those in the few minutes that I have. And um, many, most refugees who are dependent on aid in, in northern Uganda are um, sort of you know, at the mercy of, of those pipelines not being, um, not being interrupted, but they are given the, the levels of um, pledging for humanitarian support. It's already anticipated that there will be ruptures in the pipeline in the coming months. Yemen, which is not part of the IGAD region, but which is very much affected by regional dynamics and both in terms of the, the conflict there as well as people moving back and forth, so we included it in this analysis. Of course, because of the violence there, has a lack of access to markets, uh, disrupted food supply, really difficult to get access to sources of food, and certainly agricultural production is, is greatly um, interrupted. And then in Ethiopia, there's what some might have, some say is an unprecedented, or at least in recent times, unprecedented number of um, internally displaced people who are fleeing localized conflict. And because of that, their agricultural and pastoral activities have been disrupted. So you can see this kind of clear correlation between agricultural uh, activities and, and population displacement. Some people are being displaced because the, the pressure on the land is so great. Um, or the climate conditions, the drought conditions, are such that they can no longer produce. So that may be a cause of displacement, but at the same time also displacement can itself, of course, disrupt those agricultural uh, productivity systems. So just to say something briefly about the kinds of typical responses to, uh, that happen in this region and, and in most regions of the world, to be honest, um, there tends to be a focus on people gathering, gathering people in place either in camps or in urban settlements to try to serve them more effect effective, effectively and efficiently, um, which makes some sense when you're talking about service provision, schools and clinics and, and other forms of, of services. But of course, it undercuts people's activities, their agricultural and pastoral activities, since it prevents them from being in their own land. It usually makes them have to leave land or at least most people to leave. Sometimes people leave one or two relatives on their plot of land, but the productivity will go down quite considerably because of that. Um, because of this very often, uh, particularly displacement as a result of um, environmental change very often happens after people have lost all the productivity of their land, right? They're not able to farm on their, um, to grow crops on their fields. They no longer can make a living through agriculture or through agro-pastoralism or pastoralism, so they move. They move very often hoping that that will be a short-term move, and very often those who seek to assist them also expect that it will be a short-term move. But we know that probably at least 70% of the people who are displaced in the world today have been displaced for more than five years. So very, in all likelihood, um, a, a, popu a population displacement is likely to become what, what we might call protracted, i.e. more than five years, and, but yet still gets, gets dealt with uh, and has been traditionally dealt with as, a, and as an emergency kind of humanitarian response. So, so agriculture, thinking about people's agricultural activities or their generally livelihood productivity issues has not been a major focus of um, support for the displaced until quite recently, and I'll speak about that in a minute. Sometimes when people are able to go back to their land, I mean, so when climate change has, has the unfortunate, uh, tragic um, component or sort of aspect in that very often people have to leave their land and they're never able to go back to the, the place they've been displaced from since it's been it's no longer productive. But in some cases, people are able to go back, and we find very often that this kind of short-termist approach to su supporting displacement um, sort of uh, dries up as soon as people re return to their home areas. So there's an assumption that once people have returned, the crisis is over, 
resources are needed somewhere else, and so therefore um, the kind of rehabilitation support that they need, particularly in terms of seeds and tools and um, restocking, doesn't take place. Um, and what then is what that amounts to is really this long-term lack of long-term commitment um, to help people recover fully, which then feeds into vulnerability, of course, and further displacement going on. On the prevention side, there's a lot of, uh, of course, there's a lot of drought prevention work that is aimed at this er these areas, and people who have worked on food security, if they haven't worked in this region, certainly have read a huge amounts of literature on this region because um, most of the thinking about livelihood systems, um, resilience, and, and the impacts of drought, particularly on food security systems, are inspired by developments over the last, I would say, 30 to 40 years in this region. Um, Many of these uh, f these kind of prevention these prevention mechanisms focus on agricultural support, water development, and cash transfers, and that's really important. But what I want to argue today is that the the whole approach to thinking about how to support people's livelihoods tends to be very kind of um, monolithic, if you like, that really focuses on one livelihood activity or another and doesn't recognize the diversity of livelihoods that takes place. And it also, really importantly, doesn't take seriously the fact that people need to move as part of their normal livelihood practices, whether they're agriculturalists or whether they're pastoralists or whether they're um, whatever they are uh, predominantly, um, that movement is a really important part. And when you focus only on sort of agricultural rehabilitation without focusing on the need for people to continue to move, to trade, to supplement their income through wage labor, to do a variety of other things, then the efforts will, be, will have limited impact. Um, this is a map now of the agricultural areas of Ethiopia. Um, of course, someone, people who know Ethiopia well will say there are lots of other areas of agricultural areas, but bear with me. Um, the blue is our agricultural areas, and the blue and, and darker blue show the extent to which, and there's not a uh, legend here, unfortunately, but the extent to which these communities rely not just on agriculture, but on labor migration as well to supplement their income. And it's, uh, it can be for two to three months of, of household income support that people are working on other farms or in, as wage laborers in local towns or in mines or in a whole range of other kinds of things. And so I put this here just because it helps to, to problematize the notion that agricultural communities are just agricultural communities. In fact, there's a lot of other things going on in those places. And that's just amongst people who are not displaced, a sort of relatively stable, sedentary, supposedly sedentary population actually is not so sedentary. That's the kind of um, message to take from that. So I want also to talk about a couple of different um, land-based settlement schemes that have been uh, rolled out for, for refugees in the region. This is not a new idea, actually. In the 1980s, um, there was a, quite a heavy um, focus in Africa on land-based uh, settlement schemes for refugees. So Sudan had very large um, plots of land that they distributed amongst refugee farmers, for instance. But it kind of fell out of favor, and there was more focus. If people may remember, the 1990s was declared by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees as the decade of repatriation so there are sort of fashions in the way you think about so-called durable solutions. So we have now the idea of local integration returning as a potential um, idea that is attractive. It may be attractive for a variety of different political reasons. It may be that wealthy donor countries find it better, uh, more palatable to have help people to settle within their regions of origin than to have them travel more longer distances, such as to Sweden. Um, but be that as it may, that's the approach. Uh, and so in Uganda, you have a situation where the Ugandan government has been, since about 2005 and 6, quite open, and even perhaps arguably, arguably before that, but they passed a refugee uh, law in, in, in that time, um, been quite open at trying to um, accept refugees into their country, to grant them uh, as much as possible uh, free mobility, so they're able to move in and out of settlements, between settlements and towns and cities, um, to allow them to work, and also, importantly, to allow them to uh, farm small plots of land. And, and that, um, that had been quite a successful kind of venture, for the most part, until recently, when, of course, uh, 
the spilling of large numbers of, um, or the, the dispersal of large numbers of South Sudanese, in particular refugees, into Uganda made it just impossible to give everyone the same size of land or even to receive land at all. So you have now many more conflicts between local people over the availability of land. You have refugees who receive very small plots or substandard plots or are not happy with the kinds of plots they get. Um, and, and so it's not an entirely success story. But what's been important to keep, um, to support resilience, refugee resilience in this context has been the fact that people have some land, but they also have that freedom of movement and they have the right to work in other places. And so the whole package of rights and, and um, access to assets that, that refugees have in Uganda, um, while it may not be perfect, is certainly, I would say, within the, the Horn of Africa region, a model that, um, that other countries are looking at and trying to think about how they might um, replicate them. So, yep, I had put another slide on here, and I seem to have, maybe it's on, oh, I took it, somehow it didn't get saved. All right, so I'll just tell you about this other example, um, which is in Kalabaya in uh, Kenya. So as I said, other countries are looking at Uganda thinking, could we do that, could we not? Um, Kenya, uh, in 2015, opened a new settlement outside of the Kakuma refugee camp, which is one of the world's oldest refugee camps. Um, it had been created for 70,000 refugees and at the time had 130,000. So it was not a place that could receive many more people and yet more people from South Sudan were coming in. Um, so the government of Kenya agreed to create a new site at Kalabaya and that it would be um, quite remarkably for Kenya, which hasn't really um, been very, very welcoming of refugees in, in many respects, agreed to make that a land settlement scheme and to provide uh, plots of land to refugees to become self-sufficient. Um, the issue there was that whereas in, in Uganda, refugees were getting two and a half hectares of land uh, per household, at least at the, at the start, um, at the start of this scheme in Kenya, they were getting 670 square meters, really. Um, and so it wasn't enough to make a, a viable, in, a viable um, kind of self-sufficient household. It has really made an, uh, made an improvement in people's dietary diversity, um, has a small impact on the number of meals they eat a, eat a day. So in Kakuma, they eat one and a half meals a day, and in, in Kalabaya, 1.8. But that's still not three, and it's not even two. Um, and in um, uh, uh, Alexander Betts and, and his team at Oxford have done a lot of quite in-depth research and, and survey work in that area and found that um, whereas in Kakuma about 89% um, of the households are food insecure, in Kalabaya it's 79%. So it's still very, very high levels of food insecurity, despite the fact that there's this, this, um, this settlement scheme. And the reason for that, I would argue, is that, there's not a, there, that people are not allowed to own livestock. Um, they're worried that the local Turkana neighbors will um, resent the fact that there's a new livestock source in the area. So they're just made to be farmers. They don't, are not able to move, except for going between Kakuma and Kalabaya, they're not able to move within the country freely. They're not able to work they're not able to own most property. And so the whole, that whole bag of different other kinds of, of rights is missing, and therefore, um, as a result, uh, the, what, what good comes out of an agricultural settlement scheme is hampered by the, these other kinds of things that are missing. Um, just to say something about urban displacement, so here, um, this is some more, I don't know why the photo has not completely come out, but this is a photo of an IDP settlement in Mogadishu in Somalia. Um, and uh, what we see here is that people who have rural backgrounds have either moved from those rural areas into the city as a result of recurrent drought, or they lived in, as refugees in uh, Kenya, mostly in the Dadaab refugee camp, and have come back to Somalia, but find that they can't go back to their rural areas. And so most of the people living in these places have been displaced for a very long time, in some cases more than 25 years. And there's still a narrative around sending people back to their farms to be farmers. And most of the young people who have, are living in these places, young meaning anything less than 30, um, have never been farmers. They've never had any experience in that. They're not even sure, in some cases, where their farm might be. If it, in fact, if it is there, do they still have title to it? 
and what would they do if they were to go back. So there's a real urbanization. Displacement has become an urbanization story. In the next several, not too many years, uh, it's estimated that more Somalis will be urban than are rural. And I know there are a few Somali colleagues here in the audience um, who will know that the, you know, the, the sort of identity, the national identity of Somalis, if there is one, is, is to be as a pastoralist or an agro-pastoralist. And the idea that there are more people now living in cities than are actually living in the countryside is, is a very large uh, change. And so the, the focus there, rather than on trying to rehabilitate urban or rural farmland for people to go back to, really needs to be about improving housing availability on services, providing vocational training and employment in urban spaces so that people can um, in, embrace those. That's not to say, I think there's a really important piece of work that, uh, or, or kind of lesson that's come out of some of the work that I've been involved in and, and other colleagues in the region, that it's not to say that urban economies are totally separate from and isolated from rural economies, of course. We know that just about every household living in an IDP settlement in Mogadishu will have one or two relatives who's living in the rural area and they're sharing resources back and forth in really effective ways. And so one of the, the, the benefits of actually providing support to these urban um, centers is that they often share resources with uh, their relatives in areas that humanitarian actors don't have any access to. Um, so, uh, finally, just to say something about what the implications of all this are. Um, I've tried to make the argument that really that livelihoods are much more diverse than they're generally given credit for. Um, that livelihood support so far has tended to be focused on these kind of single solutions, on a kind of monolithic approach to livelihood systems. Um, and that in so doing, they tend to discourage mobility. They tend to try to lock people in place. And I think this is true of most of our development frameworks, tend not to be very mobile uh, and not to recognize that when we talk about resilience, one of the main forms of resilience that people, whether they're rural or urban, tend to engage in is mobility. And we sort of, I think we're, at, as a whole, not just in this sector, but as a whole, um, challenged to try to find ways of putting development policy into, into motion. And in terms of what specifically would, would help facilitate um, uh, these kind of um, more, more resilient livelihoods, I think, really focusing on, on facilitating movement before disaster, during disaster, sometimes people are blocked and not able to go to places that they need to get to, and also really having a long-term post-disaster approach that, that brings a, an understanding and an appreciation of mobile livelihoods into play would be really important. And really important to recognize that these livelihood systems are incredibly diverse and that even where there is agricultural practice car being carried on, very often it's one of many, many different kinds of income sources and, act, and livelihood activities that all need to be kind of supported at the same time. Um, and so, and then the final point is that um, this kind of support to agricultural um, practices is really important, sort of necessary but not sufficient, both to prevent displacement as well as to resolve the problems of those who are displaced. I'll leave it there. <laughs>